we saw in the previous video that theta of fn is really the set of all functions with the same order of group as f of n. We can define big O of fn, f of n, in an analogous way. Big o, big o of f of n is the set of all functions with the same or a smaller order of growth than f of n. So any function that is a part of this set, big O of f of n, is either going to have the same order of growth as f of n or a smaller order of growth than f of n. For example, the set big O of n square, taking f of n as n square, the set big o, big o of n square is going to have functions like n square. Why is n square a member of this set? Because n square has the same order of growth as n square. Why is 100 n plus 5 a member of this set? Because 100 n plus 5 has a smaller order of growth than f of n. We saw that in a video uh, prior to this one where we took a linear function, a general linear function a n plus b, and we prove that it is big O of n square. Log n likewise has a smaller order of growth than n square, and so log n is present in this set. We also saw in the last video that n cube does not belong to big O of n square. Likewise, if we take function like n to the power 4 plus 10, this also does not belong to big O of n square because its, or its rate of growth or its order of growth is larger than that of n square. So we can define big O of f of n very formally in set theoretic notation as the set of all functions t of n such that there exists a constant c2, a positive constant c2 such that t of n is bounded from above by a constant multiple of f of n for all values of n that are large, larger than some positive threshold n naught. So if you compare this with the formal notation for big theta of f of n, we only have an inequality for the upper bound here. For theta of f of n, we had another constant. So there, ne there needed to exist two constants, c1 and c2, such that t of n was not only bounded from above by c2 times f of n, but it also needed to be bounded from below by c1 times f of n. And so t of n had to be tightly bounded from above as well as from below by a constant multiple of f of n. So it had to be sandwiched between two constant multiples of f of n. Whereas here we are only talking about an upper bound, which is a relatively lose bound because there is there's nothing, uh, uh, we, we don't, there is no constraint on T of n being bounded from below. The only constraint is about T of n requiring to be bounded from above.